Hi there, my name is Annie Vidio, and I'll be taking you through what every employer needs to know. And we'll talk about the key labor and employment laws overview if you want to start your own business. Um, just as a disclaimer, this is a broad overview. It's not exhaustive of every topic or law that applies, so there may be things that we don't cover, and I'll try to flag them as I go along if I haven't covered something that may be important. So, Depending on which industry you're in, the California wage orders may also apply in addition to the laws on this slide. And also you should always check local laws such as San Francisco, Emeryville, Oakland and Alameda, and Los Angeles, which all have other requirements for employers. So the California Fair Housing and Employment Act, you need five employees, including out-of-state employees. For the California Labor Code, which is going to govern a lot of what we discuss in this presentation, you only need one employee. For the Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act, you need 20 employees. For the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, you need 50. Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the federal equivalent of the California Labor Code, again, one employee. For Title VII, which has a lot to do with protected categories, including gender, race, etc., you need 15. And the same number of 15 applies to the Americans with Disabilities Act. <coughs> Okay, so let's start at the beginning of the employee life cycle, hiring and training. So what do we need to do and what do we need for hiring employees? So the first stop is the interview. So under California and federal law, there are certain questions that you can and cannot ask. So we have the questions that we should be asking. You've got job related questions. You know, what type of skills do you bring to this job? What type of experience do you have in this job? Uh, what do you enjoy about the potential of working in this position, things like that. You can ask expected compensation. So what do you expect to be paid for this type of position? You can ask behavioral questions. Um, how would you respond in this type of situation? Tell me about a past experience where you have handled working on a team, things like that. You can also ask about prior experience and roles. What type of experience have you had in working in, you know, a car business or whatever type of business you may have? What previous roles have you held that would give you experience that would be helpful in this situation? You can also ask knowledge related questions. What is your knowledge of working with cars, working in a restaurant? What is your knowledge about an engineering or electronics or educational background in that a specific field. You cannot ask about salary compensation history. So there's complicated laws in California where you can't ask an applicant what they made at a previous job or what they what their previous salary was or um, you know things like that. And if it's a current employee that you're planning on moving to a different role, you may ask about their you may consider their prior salary within your business. Um, and I'd also like to just, you know, when I say salary, that means a salaried employee or an hourly wage. It applies to both. You cannot ask employees about their criminal background. You cannot ask questions about protected status. That's age, gender, race, sexual orientation, uh, veteran status, citizenship, things of that nature. So when hiring employees, we have a handful of recommended new hire documents and this paperwork is helpful because it helps lay out the clear terms of the employment relationship and many of these things are actually required by law. So we recommend that you have an offer letter that clearly lays out an at-will employment provision and the pay rate. So what does at-will employment mean? At-will employment means that either the employer or the employee at any time with or without cause may end the employment relationship. This is very important for protecting yourself from liability um, when employees can come back and say, well, I was promised I would be employed for a year and then you want to terminate them prior to that. It also allows employees the ability to resign from employment whenever they want. You need an I-9 for employment eligibility verification. You need a W-4 for tax withholding purposes. And for non-exempt, which means hourly, and we'll go into that a little bit later, employees, you need a labor code section 2810.5 notice. 
So what is a Labor Code Section 2810.5 notice? So Labor Code Section 2810.5 requires a written notice that includes various items, including, but not limited to, and you should check out the statute, which can be found just from a simple Google, the pay rate, um, and the basis, so is it a shift, is it by day, is it salary, uh, is it commission, including rates for overtime as applicable. So if you are hiring hourly employees, as I'll explain later, you may also need to list out their overtime rate. Um, allowances, if claimed as part of the minimum wage, which includes meal or lodging allowances. Uh, the regular pay rate designated by the employer and also the name of it, your employer, which seems sort of like, why does that need to be on there in the way that we're legally doing business? But this is a requirement of California law that you do need to comply with. So under California law, if you have um, more than five employees, you are required to provide certain trainings to all employees, regardless of whether they're supervisory or not. So effective January 1, 2021, employers with five or more employees must provide two or more hours of sexual harassment training to supervisory employees and one or more hours of sexual harassment training to non-supervisory employees, which includes contractors and temps and anyone that is basically within your employment purview. So for these sexual harassment training, there are various specified topics that must be covered in accordance with California law, and they also must be conducted by a trainer with certain qualifications. Um, I've obviously not provided them on the slide. The Department of Fair Employment and Housing has very helpful guidance about what must be covered. So for example, bullying and hypotheticals on gender expression and identity must be included under California law. I highly recommend that you check out the DFEH website, which is dfeh.ca.gov to figure out what exactly is required. So, so far, we've mostly been just calling any potential workers for your business employees. And so what you may be wondering is, well, what if I want to hire independent contractors? So there's good reason for wanting to hire independent contractors, which is that certain employment laws only cover employees, not independent contractors. Also, as you may know, taxes are not withheld for independent contractors. But, and as you can see, it's a big, bold, but bigger than anything else on the slide. It is very, very, very challenging under California law to show that a worker is an independent contractor. So we do not recommend that you hire as a, a worker as an independent contractor in California. Okay, now we're going to talk about payday and leaves and, you know, what goes on when you're, once your employee is actually working for you. Okay, so now let's get into the non-exempt status hourly employee thing that I was talking about before. So California requires employers to pay non-exempt employees a minimum wage of $12 an hour. And some cities, for example, San Francisco, LA, Emeryville, have higher minimum wages. So please, if you're operating in whatever city, just check out your local minimum wage in case it's higher. It also requires that non-exempt employees are owed overtime, which occurs when they work over eight hours in a day, over 40 hours in a week. And when they work, that time, they are entitled to one and a half times the regular hourly rate of pay. Also, if they work over 12 hours in a day, they are entitled to two times the regular rate of pay. And on top of that, if you have employees work over seven days a row in a work week, there are other requirements. And so you should not have employees work seven days in a row in a work week. Um, the one and a half times overtime rate also applies to the first eight hours worked on that seventh day. So that just gets confusing and you don't want to deal with all of that in the weeds. So the default for employees is that they are non-exempt unless that you can prove that they can fit into a slim category of responsibilities and you can prove that more than they spend more than 50% of their time on these types of responsibilities. And so these duties are administrative and professional employees who are paid on a salaried basis and those fall into executives 
And then it's also administrative and professional employees who do the same. And then outside salespeople. So if you fall into an exemption, which we recommend that you just pay your hourly employees and you classify them as non-exempt, you must be paid a salary that is less, at least twice the state minimum wage for full-time employment. And this salary must be guaranteed and predetermined. And so this is something, if you do choose to hire an exempt employee, that needs to be clearly laid out in the offer letter. And the offer letter should also state if the employee is non-exempt. The applicability of exemptions is very fact specific and is based on the employer employees, job duties and the pay structure and qualifications. So they must also use their independent judgment and use of discretion in their job. So we recommend that you pay hourly and non-exempt. So regardless of whether you're paying your employees and they're non-exempt or exempt, there are various requirements on payday. First and foremost, we just wanna say, we recommend that you engage a payroll company to run your payroll and issue wage statements. There is a lot to keep track of. It is very confusing and it will serve you in very good stead if you have another processor handling this part of the process. So employees must be paid semi-monthly. You can pay them more frequently, but we recommend that you pay on a semi-monthly basis to just avoid confusion. And um, the at the, le at the very least, they must be paid semi-monthly. On each payday, employees must be provided with an accurate itemized wage statement, which includes tons of different topics, including the gross wages earned in the pay period, the total hours worked in the pay period, all deductions, including taxes and health care and any other things from the employee's wages, the net wages earned in the pay period, the start and end date of the pay period, and all applicable hourly rates in effect during the pay period and the corresponding number of hours worked at each hourly rate. So what does that mean? If an employee worked overtime, you need to list the one and a half times rate at the overtime and how many hours they worked at that rate. And if the employee worked double time, you need to list the double time rate and how many hours the employee worked at that rate. There are other Requirements that must be on the wage statement as well. This includes the employee's name and only the last four digits of the employee's social security number, um, or you can use an employee identification number. And you also need the full name and address of the legal entity that is an employer. And that's important because you can't have abbreviations. If your business is, you know, all business company, it needs to say all business company, not ABC, even if you go by ABC in the public. Okay, so what about when employees leave and we're at the end of the life cycle? So a final paycheck is due on the day of termination if an employee is involuntary terminated, involuntarily terminated, so if you fire the employee. And where the employee gives more than 72 no hours notice of his or her resignation, that final paycheck is also due on the day of termination. You have a little bit more leeway if an employee gives you less than 72 hours notice of their resignation. In those situations, a final paycheck is due within 72 hours of the resignation. Under California law, employers do not have to provide paid time off or vacation time. But if an employer does provide it, any unused accrued paid time off or vacation must be paid out in accordance with the same rule as the final paycheck. And do not just mail this final paycheck to the employee. Instead, have it available at the office or work location. Only mail it as if, if that's what the employee requests. You may also offer, we may mail it, can we mail you your final paycheck? But unless the employee consents to that, do not mail the final paycheck. Have it available at, at, on the day of termination in the circumstances where it's necessary or within 72 hours if that is a voluntary resignation with less than 72 hours notice. Okay, so what about during the day? Do employees get breaks? Answer, yes. For non-exempt or hourly paid employees, employers must provide non-exempt employees meal and rest break during the day if the following conditions are met. So after three and a half hours worked, employees are entitled to one 10 minute rest break free of duty. 
if there have been six to 10 hours worked, an employee is entitled to two 10 minute rest breaks after that time period. After five hours worked, an employee is entitled to a 30 minute meal break, but keep in mind that employees can waive this period if they work for under six hours. So if an employee is work, works for five and a half hours, they may waive the 30 minute meal break. However, if an employee works eight hours, after five hours, they must be provided with a 30 minute meal break. They cannot waive that meal break period. In addition, a second 30 minute meal break and a third 10 minute rest break must be provided for over 10 hours worked. Why is this important? Because there is a penalty of one hour of pay each time an employee is not provided with a meal break and there is an additional penalty of one hour pay of each time an employee is not provided with a rest break. So California law is punitive on this and so we want to make sure that we are trying to be in compliance with these meal and rest break requirements. Okay, what happens if employees get sick? So under California law, employers must provide accrued sick leave to employees who work for at least 30 days. Sick leave determination and drafting a policy are complicated and there are many options. For example, as I mentioned before, although vacation and paid time off is not required, if you do give those type of policies, you can build in sick leave into your paid time off policy. You should work with the payroll company that I strongly recommended in the last couple slides on tracking sick leave and you can check the government websites that I mentioned, state and local, about the applicable sick leave requirements. And again, another emphasis, especially if you're in San Francisco, you really want to check on what San Francisco law requires because it can be more stringent than California law. If possible, you should try to talk to counsel about sick leave policies because it is complicated and it would be, you know, helpful to have a guiding hand. Um, please also note that there is a very complicated legal structure for types of disability, including pregnancy and leaves of absences that I am not going to cover today. This is one of the topics that I flagged at the beginning. Um, please be sure to either speak to counsel if you can or check the government websites, which I'll provide at the end of this presentation for questions related leaves of absences and disability leave and what type of requirements employers are required to engage in before uh, going off on that process. All right, so that's it for now about the nitty gritty of the employment relationship. I'm now going to turn to discrimination, retaliation, and harassment, and the types of things that employers are required to do in these situations. All right, so what are the protected categories? At the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that certain laws and certain state and federal laws protect people in protected categories. What are these? So you may generally think of them as gender, race, age, religion, but as you can see from the slide, there is a slew of protected categories that are very important to note. Um, I think just a couple things, um, gender identity and expression have very complicated definitions that I suggest that you check out on the website if, um, I'm sorry, on the government website if you have questions about what those might be because they are specific definitions that are um, important for employers to know and be conscious of. So what is prohibited on the basis of those protected categories? So you can't not hire somebody on the basis of a protected category. You can't terminate or force somebody to quit based on a protected category. You can't discriminate in any way. And these are just examples, but you can't discriminate with respect to pay, hours, work assignments, job assignments, performance reviews and feedback and discipline on the basis of one of the protected categories listed on the previous slide. You also cannot retaliate for complaints. Complaints protected from retaliation can be complaints of discrimination and harassment, but can also be complaints about health and safety or a perceived violation of the law. Um, you can't discriminate and you can't, I'm sorry, you can't make employment decisions based on stereotypes or assumptions based on a protected category. And you can't fail to accommodate or engage in an interactive process in terms of disability 
And that's a complicated inquiry um, that I recommend that you check out a government website or speak to counsel if you can on what exactly that entails because we won't have time to cover it today. It's just a general best practice to have anti-discrimination, harassment, and retaliation policies. And you can find examples of how to best structure these on the government websites or speak to counsel if you can. All right, so I wanna go into a little bit more of what harassment is and um, give you a little bit of more of an overview. I think harassment is a buzzword that can be used in many different contexts. It has tons of different definitions. It means different things for different people. So I wanna make sure that we at least touch on a little bit more detail on what it really entails for employers. So harassment can take many forms. It can include jokes, comments, innuendo, um, it can be sexual in nature, it can be derogatory in nature, it can involve spreading rumors, sexual or otherwise, and it can be inappropriate communications. It does not have to be physical, so it doesn't have to be getting really close to someone, groping, grabbing, touching, pushing, it can be verbal in nature, and it can also be communicated directly to um, the victim or to others. Under California law, just one instance of harassment can be actionable. Now, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of the legal standard, but just know that in order for one action to be um, actionable, it does have to be sufficiently distressing such that it um, disrupts the emotional tranquility of the victim in the workplace and uh, affect the victim's ability to perform the job, uh, which is you know, a high standard. Um, in general, Harassment is based on a protected category. So it's gotta be based on one of those protected categories on the slide that we saw a couple slides ago. It's unwelcome. It's generally severe or pervasive with the exception of the one act that I just pointed out under California law. It's offensive and this is subjectively and objectively offensive. And it affects the terms and conditions of the victim's employment. So this is again, a legal inquiry that you don't necessarily have to go into, but best practice is you want to prohibit harassment in your workplace with a policy. Um, another thing I wanted to cover is who can be the target of harassment. So it could be anybody. It can be any individual, regardless of their gender. It can be employees, paid or unpaid interns, and non-employees, including independent contractors and those employed by comp companies contracting to provide services in the workplace. So harassment does not just cover the non-exempt employees that you hire and that you have on your payroll. The other thing is anybody can be the perpetrator of harassment in the workplace. It can be a coworker, it could be a supervisor or manager, and it can also be a third party, including a non-employee, intern, vendor, building security, client, customer, or visitor. So please keep that in mind when thinking about your anti-harassment policy. All right, I'm gonna move into the paperwork and what is required um, under California law and what type of paperwork we require that you, or we recommend that you keep. So as a best practice, you should keep all documents signed by employees, and this includes policy acknowledgments, offer letters, um, benefits enrollments, things of that nature. Um, all documents that are signed by employees should be in the personnel file. All employees should complete and you should retain the necessary forms, as I mentioned, I-9 employment eligibility verification, and also W-4 tax withholding forms. Um, you should maintain personnel files for all employees. And uh, here's like a non-exhaustive sort of list of what you should be thinking about and keeping in personnel files. Um, applications for employment, payroll authorization form, including any records of authorization for direct deposit, notices of warning, discipline, or termination, notices of layoffs, leave, leave of absence, vacation if you have a policy, uh, wage attachment and garnishment, notices of that, if that um, is a situation that comes up. Uh, education and training notices and records. So if you have an acknowledgement of that sexual harassment training that I mentioned, you should keep a copy of that. 
um, performance appraisals and reviews, evaluations, any formal written performance feedback should all be in the perform uh, personnel file. Um, and then attendance records, if you keep them, should also be in the personnel file. Please note that employees may review their personnel files upon written request and that you must keep personnel files for no less than three years after termination. And if an employee requests his or her personnel file after um, termination, they are entitled to their personnel file. Um, you should also maintain records of hours worked and what hourly rates and gross wages were paid to employees. And this is another um, like sort of example of why having a payroll processor company can be so helpful in keeping track of these records. So while California law does not require that employees have a handbook or a code of conduct, we do require, or sorry, we do recommend that you have one because they can help comply with the complex state, federal, and local laws that we have been discussing throughout this presentation. They help ensure fair and consistent treatment of employees. If you can turn to a policy when you have a complex employee situation come up, it's helpful to have something in writing that applies to all employees can avoid misunderstandings that could potentially lead to lawsuits if you have a policy in writing. It can orient new employees and you can help them, you know, know what they need to know about the company and what is expected of them. It can educate supervisors and managers and have them have a resource that they can use if employees have questions. And it can establish legal protections for the company, which can be very important, again, in protecting against lawsuits and potential legal liability. Under California law, you are required to have an anti-harassment policy. And as we talked about, um, you can check out the government website for guidance on what that needs to include. Um, and as I said before, employment policies are just are highly recommended. Uh, it really will make your life easier if you have written policies that you can point to. The top policies that we recommend are that at will employment policy that we discussed at the beginning, which as a reminder means that either the employer or the employee may at any time with or without cause end the employment relationship. Uh, we also recommend that in an at will employment policy, you have an express written change of at will, which basically means you'll say something like um, this at will employment agreement cannot be altered except by express written authorization by an authorized representative of the company. Uh, we also recommend an anti-discrimination and retaliation policy, policies around the meal and rest breaks that we discussed, um, laying out clearly that when employees are expected to take their rest breaks and when exactly employees are expected to take meal breaks. Um, a code of conduct, so how you expect your employees to work in the workplace, um, what you expect them to do if complaints are raised, uh, how you expect them to treat each other with respect, things like that, and then workplace standards. So another concern that you may be having is what do you do with intellectual property? If you come up with an idea or you have trademarked or um, IP processes or methods or, you know, things that you want to keep confidential about your business. So it, intellectual property can be protected through employment contracts, confidentiality agreements, and you could also restrict access to confidential information. So on the first two, these are negotiated terms in the contracts and confidentiality agreements that you can word a specific way in order to protect your confidential information. And you'll want to have employees sign those documents and acknowledge that they agree to be bound by those agreements. In terms of restricted access to confidential information, you can choose that not all employees have access to that information so that you can limit the scope of people who have access. Um, I would recommend that if you do do that and there are certain employees that have access to confidential information, that there are confidentiality agreements or an employment contract provision that governs those employees access to that information. What of those agreements is appropriate and how to draft a valid agreement really depends on the company's business needs and the info to be protected and why it needs to be protected. This is another instance where if you have the ability to speak to counsel about what you would like to protect and why, it would be very helpful in structuring those types of agreements. OK, 
Okay, so under California law, you are required to have a pretty extensive list of posters that are posted in your workplace, um, often in the break room, but it doesn't have to be where employees can see these posters that advise them of their rights and certain notices. Um, this slide is a list of the required posters under California and federal law. These posters can be accessed on the government websites that I'm going to provide on the next slide. And so you want to be sure to print out copies of these posters. We often recommend that employees laminate them, employers laminate them and just put them up in the break room so that everybody can see them. There are also companies that will print them for you and then just deliver you a packet of your posters. So um, if you're interested in that, a quick Google of, you know, required California workplace poster should lead you directly to those companies. The last thing I'll say on this topic is that California law changes frequently, both at the state and local level for what is required of employers. So if you're not sure about something, please be sure to check out the um, government websites or check out on Google, or if you can speak to counsel. ORIC also has an employment law and litigation blog where we try to keep everybody updated on what new things are coming up. So if you would like to check out the blog, if you Google ORIC employment blog, we'll be posting updates about new changes in California federal and local law. Here are the government resource websites that I um, mentioned. The government does a great job of providing resources for employers to help them be in compliance with all applicable laws. These are a great first step if you have questions and want to make sure you're doing the right thing. As a general rule, California law is more strict than federal law. And so if you comply with California law, then you will most likely comply with federal law as well. However, if you want to be extra cautious, you, cautious excuse me, you may also want to check out the federal resources that are listed on this slide. Um, the last thing I'll say is, as I've mentioned a number of times through this presentation, local laws tend to be more strict in certain cities in California than even California law. So please be sure to check out San Francisco, Emeryville, Oakland, LA, and whatever city you're in's local website in order to make sure that you are in full compliance with the law. That's it for my presentation. Um, I hope it was helpful. And as I mentioned, the resources are available. Oryx Employment Law website is available. And I hope you have a great day.